Hello everyone, today we talk about uh, English politics and administration from the Norman Conquest to the Magna Carta. So a bit of a uh, English uh, a bit, bit of an English history at this point, uh, which I haven't really done very very much. Uh, if you look at my playlists, um, even the world British um, history videos are actually pretty few. And part of the reason is that objectively I never concentrated thoroughly in my life and my studies in <coughs> in medieval Britain. Although I honestly find it extremely fascinating. I love British history uh, at so many levels. Although I objectively know less. I concentrate the most in Carolingian Europe, let's <laughs> say, uh, as geographically speaking. Um, and uh, however, you know bit by bit will surely uh, build something more consistent and <clears throat> part of the reason in fact I, I you know I could have talked uh, more extensively also about um, medieval Britain but I uh, choose my topics randomly so this is actually pretty um, pretty random and the way it happens so there's no specific reason another reason why however I feel a bit I don't know uh, not extremely confident in discussing um, English or British history. Today we'll stick to, to England mostly. Um, is that it's my language. First of all, <laughs> I, I can't speak a very good English and this video is surely being watched by many people from uh, English speaking countries where um, native tongue and they uh you know i don't know that my english uh, really sucks and especially however the, the thing that worries me the most is that things that i'll be saying today will be an extremely um approximate and concentrated amount of um of, of information that everybody could really find so you've, mm, and, and probably most of you already know uh, about um, so that I will definitely incur in the criticism, both a linguistical and historical criticism of people who are much better acquainted than me with England and English history. Because I see here, the majority of you is... Um, here actually YouTube's, um, YouTube's um, statistics about the uh, geographical location of my viewers uh, kind of messed up from last autumn. I can't really um, um, see anymore every single but there, there is like the, the f first 13 results in from which I I see that uh, the first country most of you like one fourth of you is American. Mm -hmm. And in third place we have the United Kingdom in fact then Canada and then going right to the uh, ninth position, Australia, and then, yeah, I don't have in this first ranks many other English-speaking countries. Um, however, the, um, I, I realize most of you are already pretty much into um, English medieval history, so today I would like to concentrate chiefly on the structuring of the, um, Anglo-Norman Kingdom and the Angevin Kingdom of England. Afterwards, um, recently I discussed about um, the Norman Kingdom of Sicily and I traced certain parallelisms between actually these two Norman Kingdoms uh, of, of England and Sicily as um, these were objectively the most centralized um, countries of Latin Germanic Europe. And it's not a coincidence it's not a coincidence because these countries um, were, say, um, derived from, indeed, the Duchy of Normandy, broadly meant, in, even if, although in different ways, definitely, but they definitely were to Norman kingdoms proper, um, who had been, a, who had managed to export um, the Frankish, uh, Western Frankish feudalism into England and Southern Italy respectively, so in two lands that had very different traditions, not just the one from, from the other, but also from the same uh, Norman ones at this point, and that, however, gave, in this sense, an edge to the Normans to actually um, create from scratch 
in these uh, huge domains they had acquired, uh, roughly in one shot. I mean, well, of course, in the case of Hing England, it was much easier. Just took Hastings, and after that, the Anglo-Saxons had been softened up by the Norwegian invasion in the same year. In southern Italy, it took mm, it took generations before you know setting up everything fine. But generally speaking, these were territories that into which the Normans managed to build up um, something very consistent in terms of um, centralized institutions exactly because there was no progressed feudal experience so it's extremely difficult to eradicate um, uh, feudal culture in a place because simply because that's how feudalism works um, it's uh, essentially a bunch of lordships that are deeply rooted into the territory, and even though they are, they can be naturally more or less, um, uh, con say, mm, dominated by and controlled, say, better by the uh, central authority that still exists in part. They're still, ba it's it's still a system that is based in a decentralized fashion, and that therefore makes it difficult to re uh, retake all of this um, lands from central power. And actually, it's not. A really a proof of weakness to, to tell it all. Many people interpret this as if, you know, yeah, of course, centralized institutions had collapsed during post Carolingian times, so the kind of feudalism that emerged was essentially a... Um, was basing its prerogatives on the, um, let's say, the, the autonomy from central power. Um, this was mostly even in, in, the con in countries like France, that at the time, for instance, of the uh, Norman conquest of uh, England and and of Sicily was extreme. Still, you know, um, had a still a very weak monarchy. You know, had a great, uh, very great leap forward. We will arrive at today. Of the French occurred actually during the um, the, thir the beginning at the beginning of the thirteenth century. Obviously, during the twelfth, um, the French had mm, substantially progressed. So it's not really something that came out of the blue, but um, with Bouvin, let's be honest about it, France basically consolidates as the major power in Europe, and mm, its monarchy, by heavily feudal in nature, um, grew sp very strongly to be very also very, in this sense, uh, very centrally directed. So this is actually a proof that feudalism is not doesn't really equate to a lack of centralization, as actually Feudal institutions can also work as a gluing factor, and in this sense, it's not sur surprising at all that um, the Normans mm, exported the same feudalism. Um, however, the main, mm, say, achievement of the Norman dynasties of England and Sicily was indeed the ability of balancing the the centralized nature of the feudal system with certain local um say feudal uh, excuse me uh, cent say relatively more centralized traditions that were actually stronger in Sicily than in England but also in here the Anglo-Saxons telling the truth by the um by the time of the Norman conquests had developed one of the most um advanced and refined forms of administration at the time it was extremely uh, functional, and it's interesting because England always had this maintained eventually all this this kind of um, substantially organized and especially on a national say you know, on a national base um, system that made it work, made things work, and kind of helped the monarchy in spite of its weakening, uh, especially the beginning of the 13th century and eventually also later into so. You can say that England is a is a country of old organization. It took it took a while, obviously, for the Anglo Saxons to 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 build this, but you know they shaped it fine. And yeah, also because the Anglo Saxons uh, were um, as such were very fragmented at the beginning, they were also quite different in this sense from other um, Romano Germanic kingdoms. Um, they had a um, they they kind of built everything from 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 the bottom up eventually so this probably took more while other Romano-Germanic kingdoms were more unitary at the beginning but then f ended up to 
being fermented or collapsed or being invaded. Instead, England kind of went on on its own. Obviously, they had also the um, the Danish, uh, the, the Viking uh, invasions. It was uh, it, we, by the time of the Norman conquest, we can rightfully talk about for England of a uh, Anglo-Danish aristocracy very, very, very easily. But then nevertheless, even with the Dane law, with you know the general uh, the, the way that the English monarchy managed to to deal with the, with the also with the Viking threat, definitely England took a shape that definitely uh, from from an institutional and administrative point of view that really helped also the same n- norm amount control over the uh, the English territory and not just that because eventually naturally the Normans immediately expanded uh, also outside of England into Britain so but. So before we start, just give me a second to drink a little bit. So check, okay. <clears throat> oh, and just continuing a, a little bit to premise that is equally interesting. This is really the point: is that the Normans, the paradoxically up to you know, the 10th century was were nothing but Vikings in the, in the sense of you know the Duchy of Normandy, the lower sand valley that was given by the the Western Frankish kings to to Rollo. Um, in this sense, are amazing because in uh, in less than two centuries had perfectly integrated with the local system. Uh, let's not make ourselves illusions. These were not Scandinavians at this point. These were Frenchmen. Mm. And, and not, I'm not making a, uh, an ethnical point. It's obvious that these uh, there were certain areas, especially I don't know the, the Cotentin Peninsula was heavily um, um, I don't know how to say that Normanized, <laughs> Northmanized. Um, um, there were certain concentrations of Scandinav, you know, originally uh, Scandinavian communities that were was pretty strong. Definitely Normandy has an, even a different. Uh, ethnic background in, in this sense, you can still. I, I was fortunately once in, in or twice, actually, actually twice in in Normandy on on vacations. So a, a fantastic land. You can understand it's different from the other French regions, um, and partly because of this relation, definitely. And so, but the point I'm making here is that the Normans were fully French or Western Frankish, as you prefer, actually, and it's proper in. Polit- politics and society. These were a feudal society. They spoke French. They had heavy cavalry as a mounted elite. The profession. Th- they just exported the French model into England, and that's how they built it. And what is it interesting in this sense is that these populations that had a relatively an early uh, sedentarization at this point, in, as you know, formerly Scandinavian moradiers, uh, they um, they absorbed fully the feudal models mm-hmm. and they managed to export them in a m- with a more functional result into these lands of new conquest so actually making feudalism work even better uh, than was working in France it had been the uh, the the hub of the of the same um, Obviously, uh, the the no. What did I say? The hub. What is the hub in English? Wait a second. <laughs> the I don't know why I said this. I, I meant the cradle of. Excuse me. And th- that's what I, I was talking about at the beginning of the um, <coughs> of feudalism into Western Europe and into Europe as a whole. Telling the truth. So um, the. Um, so the efficacy of the feudal relations as a govern uh, as a government uh, instrument was experimented um, in in this way because you have to make it naturally. It's also a matter of will we make it? I mean, it would be extremely fascinating to 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 think what I don't know in the heads of these um, Normans the this newly conquered territories had to be organized like. Naturally you can imagine also a lot of um of debates of, you know, political 
uh, division on how to deal with this newly conquered lands as uh, still a character of the feudal system the, the Normans imported was a part you know a, a partly autonomous um, fringe of nobility that definitely didn't want to didn't fancy being um, remaining under the um, the uh, you know a central authority too much but this is I guess the point I mean also the the Duchy of Normandy was relatively centralized uh, at the beginning so uh, also William uh, was definitely uh, in, had a, a greater power than than other uh, than other sovereigns at the time so he exploited this to create definitely an uh, extremely efficient system that now we're gonna we're gonna look at so as we as were saying before and, and never to be forgotten the Normans managed to build these two kingdoms in into the north and south of Europe respectively by um, um, exploiting other territorial uh, organizations, other forms of administration mm -hmm. that allowed the same uh, feudal relations um, to be built on on, on solid basis. Mm -hmm. So, in two England that was conquered by William, Duke of Normandy, in 1066, um, it was a um, statual organization based on a uh, structure of Germanic tradition. Mm -hmm. The the hundreds that were framed into other uh, districts of of a higher level, the shires or counties, um, within which operated the um, royal agents, the sheriffs, mm, who were in charge of uh, the uh, of collecting taxes, and tax collection. Um, the so the 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 great landowners instead uh, were. Um, the uh, so the the earls uh, the, the earls let's say better if I, my pronunciation sucks had instead other mm, duties chiefly of uh, military co military coordination on vast territories that comprehended um, more shires mm -hmm. these were called instead these other districts were called the earldoms mm -hmm. so here already a hierarchical um, system that managed uh, in fact to, to you know uh, that really favored the uh, a more centralized control so William and his successors especially Henry the first who ruled in England from uh, the 11 under to 1135 um, preserved both the uh, hundreds and the shires However, they eliminated the uh, circus, uh, circus uh, wait, the districts, let's say better, that were controlled by the earls by substituting them with a new territorial structure that was um, made up by several, um, um, let's say, uh, feudal units called manors mm, that all uh, were uh, controlled uh, through a net of, uh, of castles. Mm. So in, in in twenty years, um, the um, the Normans managed to build uh, almost eighty castles, as far as we know, that were entrusted to the king in uh, exchange for a, a feudal uh, homage, mm -hmm. um, either to the same royal family and to also he, uh, um, and royal vassals, definitely that were to form the uh, nucleus of the great barons that were directly depending uh, on the uh, on the sovereign mm. so in assigning the, the, min the manners um, to the different vassals the king um, however mm, essentially framed them in a fashion that um, could prevent them to grow too strong and that could uh, give rise to, to revolts uh, against the, uh, the royal power so first of all, these manners were distant one from the other, or at least tended to be uh, built in such a faction, um, and the 
um, the same king uh, retained the say direct control of the uh, greater part of the uh, existing manors in, in every region mm -hmm. so in order to be always present everywhere mm -hmm. as the uh, most important ter um, territorial lord this naturally is uh, I'm wildly approximating because this system al also um, required a, a part of um, part of the centralization but here the, the main point is that the the king had a higher bargaining power than in other regions of Europe. So he is um, he, he still obviously ruled through clientele, through other you know uh, officers, etc. But this was shaped uh, in a, in a fashion that could contain way more than other kingdoms the um, the uh, emergence of uh, say the 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 rising power of the local barons. Um, at this, um, considering that the barons, in fact, were pretty unruly by nature, and this is, this was typical, naturally, of feudal Europe, and uh, there was no, uh, especially this time, these monarchies um, were based still on a sort of, you know, egalitarian, uh, I ideally I egalitarian. Um, Germ say egalitarian fashion of, of Germanic tradition for which the authority of the king in the first place was based theoretically on his military prowess uh, the king was considered a sort of, of primus inter pares and indeed um, the, the nobility as a whole definitely recognized royal power but was always feeling like you know, first of all eligible to, to the throne in a certain measure, but generally speaking, it was really the there was not a, a huge difference at, at this point. The monarchy had still to be um, built, even from from an ideological point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, the the idea of kingship was extremely different in the 11th century compared to the I don't know the 15th century. And telling the truth, England would be the one uh, together the, the the monarchy that together with France developed uh, the most the um, the mystics of monarchy mm? and the centralization of monarchy because by the way and this is also very important London uh, also in terms of bureaucracy of you know concentration of power central power was a much older um, capital than Paris for instance um, this, um, this is something that began from an early age into Anglo-Saxon England telling the truth um, Paris was um, also say an ancient capital we can say so but the French kings were much more itinerant than the English ones uh, at least in their maybe not uh, fr from from a really from a physical point of view because also English kings at this point really moved a lot you know some of them spent also most of their time in France or, or even somewhere else um, think about I don't know Richard Lionheart eventually um, but uh, and there is a joke that says in fact that, that uh, Richard Lionheart was the most um, appreciated English king simply because he 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 was the one who remained um, the least into England during his, his reign. But this is uh, you know an English joke that can be explained also through other you know considerations given the especially uh, yeah English history as a whole I would say. <laughs> But uh, this is not the point. The 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 point um, is that, however, the French kings were m much more itinerant as a court. They didn't have a fixed court. England, instead, uh, excuse me, London instead, maintained this um, central mm, nature. Also, because it was the major center of England. Let's be honest. Before the Industrial Revolution, London was de facto the only city in England. Um, the only true city, um, and uh, it definitely, you know, the English monarchy ended up gravitating around this, also in terms of centers of power of, and, and so on. And definitely, this process of centralization that the Normans brought in, ideally favored also partly the the continu essentially the continuity with the Anglo-Saxon so uh, the Anglo-Saxon tradition, and they're under this point of view. Um, so, in order to avoid the the English barons to 
usurp lands, which was something extremely frequent into feudal Europe, exactly because of this uh, difficulty in the control of the territory from the uh, central authority, um, um, it was created a uh, census of the manors, mm -hmm. um, uh, from which a um, a certain inv uh, of inventory came out that is uh, essentially nothing but the uh, extremely famed uh, Domesday book that was created in, I'd say completed better, in 1086. So um, this is, um, I think it's useless to stress the the importance of the Domesday book because I think everybody knows what it's about. It is this manuscript that contains, in fact, all the results of this great census completed in 1086, um, relative both to, actually, to par a part of England and a part of Wales. Mm -hmm. um, and this uh, inquiry was uh, carried out by order of William the Conqueror, and uh, he, um, seemingly, he had this meeting in during the Christmas period of uh, uh, 1085 in Gloucester, where he, when he basically debated for a long time with his counselors and found, uh, you know, and decided to send um, um, officers all over England um, in, in every single um, county to establish essentially um, how. Um, and and what, how much and and what actually every um, landowner um, owned in terms of land as well as in cattle, um, and what was the value of it? So this is what the uh, Anglo-Saxon chronicle uh, tells us. Um, so naturally, the uh, the the main uh, objective of this in inquiry was to um, quantify the goods of every. Uh, owner and uh, and and also the taxes that were essentially collected um, on on this um, property from uh, since the time of Edward the confessor so that before Harold Godwinson had been the um, say uh, the, the, the the last the last anglo-saxon king and the um so these estimates um um were mm, practically considered like low um, and that could not be discussed as as such um and uh, the name of takes the doomsday would be uh, the doomsday uh, that is essentially the judgment's day so this had um, to symbolize the rigorous and terrible sentence of the this last uh, process that cannot be avoided. You cannot escape. Just like <laughs> you can't escape the judgments, that you can't ex escape um, the control of the king. So this was very powerful uh, ideology that you see it starts also you know, to mingle with other, you know with political theory, with the mystics of, of the monarchy, and so on. Um, so that everything that was written in this book could be could not be ignored, nor um, essentially uh, mm, dismissed um, uh, by law. And, and this is what it was called doom, uh, Doomsday, because its decisions, just like the one of the um, uh, 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 universal judgments, cannot be altered. Um, this idea of that, that something cannot be altered is very important in the Middle Ages because it, it recurs in many other, you know, in practically every single political theory and it was naturally stressed um, in different ways also, sometimes also by the same uh, customary laws sometimes, not just by the monarchies. In fact, especially in England, this was very important as eventually the, the common law would emerge from this idea that the in fact, the, the natural order of the um, Anglo-Saxon law, uh, the Anglo-Saxon tradition, was in the sense something that derived from God. So even at least this was justified always because looking at the sources, God, uh, the source of these laws as God, and 
and both the um, the institutions, um, I mean the, the monarchy and the, the local communities, obviously uh, looked at, at that as the main justification. And naturally, the monarchy had a greater um, um, you can argue in part the, the monarchy in this sense was drawing l more heavily from the um, biblical traditions mm, of of, uh, of kingship etc whereas the the people was much more uh, much much closer to the customs of Germanic tradition in the sense that in fact in uh, were considered from, from 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 that point of view culturally speaking to be untouchable um, in in many ways. So the, the language of Domesday Book is par actually partly in Latin and partly in vernacular. There are uh, this is typical of many, uh, actually of all the um, uh, at least uh, I think every single European law at this time that is um, using terms in this case uh, Anglo-Saxon terms that um, did did not have an equivalent in Latin. Obviously, some were transliter. Uh, tr actually, yeah, some some were directly trans transliterated into Latin. That is, essentially, they there was the Latinization of a, of an Anglo-Saxon name that was expressed in a in, in its Latin version, not in its Latin translation. Others were directly said translated with certain terms in Latin that, however, was um, semantics and, and and etymology are not r are not the same, obviously. So sometimes in these laws you still find uh, Germanic names that are directly expressed uh, because everybody knew in in that community what they meant. If it had been written in Latin, people would not understand. And actually, the need of um, ex um, of these code of laws to to express themselves in a under, uh, an intelligible fashion was definitely a, a great aim of of the um especially medieval times. I mean that this law had to be clear, it had to be understood by everybody so it could be enforced without excuses in this sense. Um and this um the Domesday book was a, an extraordinary work at this time. Uh, I I don't want to concentrate now. Maybe uh, we will dedicate to the Domesday book another another video by itself because it, it really deserves it. Um because it helps us understand uh, a lot about naturally what um, um, the um, uh, uh, as uh, Anglo-Norman society was at this point. Actually, the Domesday book it's two different works. It's the Little Domesday and the Great Domesday. Now I don't want to get into details, but um, it's. Um, uh, especially the little domesday is extremely more detailed than the great domesday and it offers um, so many uh, informations about the uh, the various uh, tenors and all it however excuse me a drink once again okay um so, the important point to remember is, however, that this work contains the registration of all the land tenures of the kingdom, hmm? with the indication of their extension, the number of inhabitants, of um, of the uh, royal vassals that uh, owned them, and the um, rights and uh, duties, of, so obligations that were connected to every fief. Hmm? So, in in an obvious intent to control uh, this society and uh, chiefly for, for tax uh, for taxation so that nobody could say, and this was actually typical of all Latin Germanic Europe, I mean things worked all, all the same. Uh, the the great uh, the greater aspect was the indeed the uh, the level of organization uh, even a bureaucracy that already existed in order to achieve such a um, such a uh, a detailed census at the time mm -hmm. because in other areas of Europe the um, such census did not exist and why because there was 
not as um, the, the central authority was too weak to even bother itself to to do such a thing, but not because they were poor and they couldn't send people around to to uh, re uh, register all the uh, various um, um, properties and so on, but simply because the the, the king could not uh, extend his power over this large area. So the actual political practice translated into political negotiation, bargaining. So at that point it was not required to have a census and to spend a cen uh, to spend in order to create because also this was a pretty um expensive process also to to register all these uh, properties and all and so on to uh, the uh, properties that eventually you could not control. Mm. So this is why in other uh, countries this was not done and and this tells you implicitly the level of centralization of the English kingdom at this point. Um, that is naturally not a modern centralization. This was obviously laughable for, for uh, you know even modern era times, but not so much telling the truth because the Domesday book, even into the same. Um, England was uh, not really repeated for um, for a very long time, but to say that this was still a, it was not a not omni centralized thing. You know, this was still a relatively it was a uh, say the most centralized together with King Kingdom of Sicily, Kingdom in Europe. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Kingdom of Sicily was even more centralized than the one of England, but. Even in different, w actually in different ways, and um, even though the uh, also the uh, the Norman, the secular Norman kings had this um, these registers that controlled or the various property of the kingdom, there is nothing like the Domesday Book in terms of uh, detail and um, order in this sense. So. The sheriffs that, as we have seen, with the, were the royal um, agents present into the uh, in the shires, um, were um, uh, were in charge of the custody of castles, and they be, uh, became the base of the uh, administrative reorganization of England after the uh, Norman conquest. <coughs> so the the activity of the sheriffs was uh, at this point um put under the um the uh, Eshaker, um tribunal or Eshaker, Eshaker, i believe it's in english however this these were um french uh names in origin so the the in origin in fact the term was uh, a Eshaker, mm -hmm. and it it already existed telling you truth as a tribunal into the Duchy of Normandy, uh, so eventually was uh, um, copied into uh, the Kingdom of England, and there was an equivalent in in uh, in other kingdoms and also in in France uh, as la Chambre de Comte, and and this existed actually at several levels, not just in the uh, you know at a centralized level, but also in other minor principalities. So the Échiquier um, de Normandie uh, was created by Rollo. Um, so uh, the first Norman duke at the beginning of the 10th century. So the um, there were other Échiquier uh, in other uh, in other circumstances in French um, history and so on, and the um, and the Échiquier uh, uh, Échiquier was. Um, extremely important because it had to deal with essentially the public purse. Mm -hmm. So uh, in England, it th this uh, Eshaker was created at the beginning of the 12th century, mm -hmm. and the main objective was to better and to and to rationalize essentially the management of the royal uh, incomes. Mm -hmm. Income, sorry. Um, so, all this control and properties and all with these uh, royal officials, etc., is always for the aim ends of tax collection. Mm -hmm. 
And this is so important because uh, that's what really all the um, European powers at this time were struggling for. That having enough power as monarch, uh, monarchs to extend the, you know, to, to draw taxes from the territories that were under their domination. And this, as we've seen, was a system was extremely favored in England, not just by the fact that the Normans had wiped out the um, the Anglo-Saxon, the Anglo-Danish aristocracy, but also because the, there were other administrative forms already present into Anglo-Saxon England, and now the Normans were essentially reshaping, re, uh, readapting to, to their needs with great benefit. Um, so another very clever thing that the Anglo-Norman kings did, um, and that mm, has also in here very mm, similar equivalents to into other places of Europe, was to um, essentially back to support the um, urban communities, the boroughs. Um, so these um, was. Um, um, so the, the we're at the time uh, also in England. We at this time we are uh, at a moment of great economical expansion, mm -hmm. especially uh, countries like England and Germany were mm, rising um, uh, economically speaking even more than other areas in, in proportion like France or Italy. Um, not because they were more they were wealthier than them uh, at all. Uh, England wasn't objectively a, a, a great power, but uh, eventually it made it, even in the Middle Ages, to be a, con a, a, a force to be reckoned with thanks to this omni-comprehensive administration. And the Baroques were very important to this because they were, um, as in other areas of Europe, the um, centers of uh, mercantile and uh, expansion and the you know the development of crafts and, and all uh, as we were saying before England had a low level of urbanization these boroughs were mm, usually even really relatively new I mean that were naturally Roman cities into Britain that kept being very important and such especially as um, not just London um, as a proper capital let's say but um, also many um, r uh, eccles ecclesiastical centers. Mm -hmm. uh, naturally, there were boroughs that also emerged from 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 uh, Roman centers, but uh, it's they, they were usually smaller um, villages that now were rising speedily through trade and and so. On. Um, and this was very important to do. I mean, to to support them uh, um, um, because. Um, these could uh, these uh, communities could work essentially as a counterbalance to the uh, to the uh, to the feudal nobility. Mm. So the kings at this point also promoted the um, the uh, cost uh, the, the local uh, customs of the uh, uh, communities uh, in order f from one side to strengthen the supremacy of the monarchy um, by saying, you know, by posing itself as a legitimizing force that in this sense, in order to um, that that was legitimized in turn, because obviously these communities say, okay, we get recognized by the king, uh, our, uh, our rights recognized by the king, so we implicitly need the monarchy to exist, because as long as the monarchy is um, is solid, we can't see this power recognizing our our custom. So it was a really a double, uh, it was a mutual relation. From another uh, side, uh, the monarch by developing these uh, trade centers, the monarchy could uh, definitely increase uh, its income. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that naturally uh, derived to taxation by the development of their activities and it's not just about this because um, you know having a, a wealthy kingdom in general is if, if it is controlled is always uh, uh, it can allow you having also many resources in case of emergence because theoretically there were other um, 
you know, even the, the practice of politics of, 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 of war was could be also much less uh, mindful of the local rights and so on. So having just a, a, a wealthy country equated to be able to draw in case of emergency, uh, even against the local customs, more resources than, than, than a poor country, definitely. But it's really the, the balance. This, happened, this happens a bit everywhere in Europe at this time, of trying to uh, develop certain centers to counter the 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 uh, the centrifugal force of the nobility, this is what the Normans also did in Sicily. That they had to conquer many cities that were a bit too independent for their tastes, but never actually raising them to the ground because they could be used as a counter balance to the baronial power. This is what happened in France, where uh, you know the French has this highly aristocratic and posh. <laughs> <coughs> uh, contempt for the commoners, for instance, but sometimes in order to to stem <coughs> the the uh, the, the uh, excessive power of the uh, high nobility, they backed the the growth of certain villages hmm, that could, in this sense, present also as a uh, represent a kind of a military force against them. This was done in Germany, <coughs> where the uh, Freie Reichsstädte uh, uh, were cr uh, founded and you know recognized uh, city uh, rights and so on by the German kings and, and emperors to um, to essentially stamp the expansion of the um <coughs> German German princes. Um, this naturally happened in many um, different, I mean, I in similar ways all over Europe, even if, if, if with um, consistent differences. Um, it was a pretty clever way to, to, to maintain a balance, because this was the only way, actually, these monarchies at the time could, um, could maintain an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Really playing a bit here, a bit there, so to maintain always, uh, like really, there was a lot of political equilibrism indeed, um, and and this was complicated because certain privileges, certain uh, prerogatives that were recognized also by the crown were theoretically to be maintained, so this also created problems because the political balance was still pretty, pretty, um, pretty, uh, unstable definitely and many there was also a lot of back and forth in terms of um, concessions and so on but this was a viable option that uh, could be um, always conceived as at a structural level so in um, from a, a legal point of view um, especially at, around the kingdom of Henry the I, um, it, it emerged the tendency of um, subtract to the um, from from the local tribunals so the the hundreds of the the tribunals of of the hundreds of the or, or the shires the um, most um, relevant causes in order to reserve them um, to for um, royal justice, essentially, and um, these um, legal functions were um, entrusted to a net of judicial agents that um, worked um, in all the different regions of of the uh, English um, of the English monarchy. Excuse me, I drink one second. So William <coughs> and the first actually left to uh, his successors two very solid political organisms uh, that were in fact the, the Kingdom of England and the Duchy of Normandy that were a hell of a uh, domain altogether and this time the uh, the king, uh, the the kings of uh, you know the, the dukes of Normandy in this sense uh, were 
even more powerful than the Western Frankish king himself, simply because they were kings of England as well. And um, while the French king controlled more or less just an area around the Ile de France, the Dukes of Normandy not only controlled this solid uh, Norman duchy, but of the northern France, but also the whole kingdom of England and even beyond, as we'll see, also the expansion into Wales and to other areas. So, yeah, it was a hell of a uh, domain that was, by the way, very important. Um, you know, it was very important for, for William the Conqueror having seized England as, in fact, as a land of conquest. This is really the point, because one thing is receiving a land from, like, in fact, like it happened with, with Normandy, um, by a king and to be there on, on the behalf essentially of that uh, authority doesn't matter how e effectively autonomous you are England had been conquered by uh, with ar by arms and this made this land a sort of personal property of the king mm -hmm. as obviously not as uh, comprehensively because the Anglo-Saxon community naturally M maintained, as we've seen, is uh, their own, uh, say, its own sense of unity, and it, it wasn't easy, you know, to to conquer England. Telling the truth, I mean, it was easy once naturally the Anglo-Saxon forces had been annihilated at Hastings, but uh, differently from from Sicily, for instance, um, it took really uh, decades of slaughters of massacres of destructions before the Normans eventually managed to control decently the whole England. So it was actually the Norman conquest of England was a pretty dark um let's say uh, moment for 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 this uh, um th th these results were also achieved in part through simply wiping out every everybody who opposed this 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 thing. I mean initially uh, even as we were saying before with the Anglo-Saxon uh, aristocracy initially William kind of co-opted this uh, but, uh, individuals, but eventually these were taken out and substituted with with um, Norman noblemen. So um, it was a pretty mm, hard, um, and there was um, a moment, and, and there was also this contempt that originally the, the Normans had towards the Anglo-Saxons, because they deemed them you know, in typical feudal and Germanic fashions, so at both as, you know, commoners, and generally, at least since the Anglo-Saxon aristocracy had been wiped out by the Normans, and plus um, conquered people. So, uh, you know, feudal mindset here was extremely bad, really. They, you know, if you were, you know, the, 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 a Norman knight, a Norman noble would feel himself to be, like, the the greatest guy on earth, at superior, even at a level of of uh, almost of the sense of a mm, from from a genetic point of view, because having noble blood equated ideally to being a superior being. Uh, peasants were conceived like half of animals; they could be slaughtered easily. There was no, uh, and and this naturally was uh, stemmed just by the fact that uh, the the local communities were still pretty, you know, capable of rebelling, creating problems, so there was a naturally a uh, a also in here a negotiation between these two forces, but really the the feudal aristocracy conceived itself to be a sort of uh, untouchable caste as of elected uh, people huh? that proved their own prerogatives to the exercise of arms. Mm -hmm. And at this time the uh, Indeed, cavalry uh, was, and chivalry, as bro broadly speaking, was rising as the, uh, you know, this model was being reinforced, and this mindset with this mindset framework was being reinforced, and so initially, however, the um. This is a bit of a question also could be interestingly answered, but I won't because it's also complicated. You know, why England and Normandy were actually not unified as such? Because 
here there are many problems. It's first of all, it was more convenient for William to maintain his English domains uh, detached from the Norman ones because this, for the reason we were saying before, this was a conquered land, so it had to stay out from the French business in practice. Secondly, um, so this equated naturally to 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 use this land at at will, you know, it would be always at the disposal of the Anglo-Norman dynasty as such. However, there was still some reason of, you know, uh, this was these lands were split essentially between his sons, initially, to be reunified under Henry I. So, even never forget the uh, succession problems in, in this um, in this context as the you know the, the according to Germanic tradition, these lands were always divided more or less equally between the male sons. Uh, so the the actually the, the greatest civil wars of feudal Europe emerged from from this very problem. And in fact, at the death of Henry um, the first, there was a phase of English history that is called as the uh, the anarchy essentially it was this uh, moment of crisis of civil war if you want uh, during which the crown of England was um, was um, essentially contended um, between um, Henry's daughter Mathilda widow by the way of the of the Emperor Henry V of the Holy Roman Empire and uh now uh wife to Godfrey Plantagenet, so Count of Anjou, and actually her cousin, Stephen of of Blois. So this was a, a very um you know, civil wars are not nice <laughs> and, and, and this is especially important because it you know wars really mess up society at so many levels so this moment of anarchy was really detrimental in part for the um for the unity of the uh, administrative uh, you know in the institutional system that had been created by the early anglo-norman kings so um by the way, Stephen of Blois was also nephew to uh, William uh, the the Conqueror, and he um, um, so. Sorry, I'm looking at my, well, whatever. Now I'm not sure about the genealogy here, but you know, probably know it better than me. However, the the point is that Henry the First had remained without male heirs, mm. um, especially after the uh, this happened because of uh, of an episode that was the shipwreck of the White uh, Ship. That was basically a um, where uh, f one I think 140 of of the Anglo Norman members of the Anglo-Norman aristocracy had um, drowned into the channel when this ship had sunk and, and it had naturally brought to a great imbalance, political imbalancement in, in the kingdom and at that point Henry had um, his barons sworn that they would have accepted the succession to the English throne of uh, his uh, daughter Matilda uh, however, when Henry died, Stephen of Blois was uh, had himself crowned by um, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, William the uh, Corbeil, and this, uh, you know, civil war answered as no sign, basically, for especially in the first years, uh, managed to to prevail the one on the other. Uh, Matilda uh, owned at this point the south way. It's an extremely complicated history telling storytelling, so I make it very very simple. Um, she um, controlled the uh, southwest of England, and the um, even um, controlling a very important part of the Thames Valley, 
while um, Stephen, uh, Stephen maintained control of the southeast. So this, by the way, was the the wealthiest. Um, you know, the south was uh, the lowlands were the the the, the uh, most uh, fertile in the areas of England. So the ones that eventually could provide the resources for controlling the wall, the wall kingdom, and um, eventually in. 1141, uh, Stephen was captured at the Battle of Lincoln, and this um, brought to the collapse of his authority in a great part of the country. However, during the uh, uh, during Matilda's crowning, the uh, crowd in, in London uh, rebelled uh, to her, and she was uh, obliged to leave the city. So the half brother of um, Matilda, uh, Robert of Gloucester, was also uh, captured in the uh, battle, at the say the defeat of Winchester. And so, what happened is that these two sides uh, exchanged prisoners, and Godfrey the fifth of Anjou. Um, uh, husband of Mathilda actually at this point managed to conquer Normandy and he was therefore uh, recognized um, as legitimate um, lord by the uh, the, king, the French king Louis the seventh because that was a, indeed a French fief so the French king could inter uh, could intervene also in to the English affairs by you know uh, having this his say on on the uh, Duchy of Normandy and therefore altering the balance uh, eventually also across the channel. So eventually in 1148 the Empress, as Matilda was called because of her uh, former imperial marriage, uh, came back to Normandy and um, she left um, the, uh, the, the clash to be continued by her son Henry. So now Stephen attempted in vain to um, make his um, son, uh, his own son, recognized as a legitimate successor. At least, um, um, asking the support of, the, uh, searching, the, seeking the support of the church. Mm -hmm. um, when um, Henry uh, Plantagenet, um, however, invaded England in 1153. Both factions were like exhausted by the war, and after a very short campaign and the siege of Wallingford, Henry and Stephen came to an agreement, and they uh, the same they signed the Treaty of Wallingford, in fact, into which the king recognized Henry as his legitimate heir. So Stephen died the year after, and uh, the young son of, Ma uh, of Matilda came uh, ro rose to the throne as Henry the Second, so becoming the first Angevin king of England, uh, the Plantagenet, and this um, process, I will, as we will see now, began a moment of, of, of great, you know, uh, began a moment of, uh, a period of reconstruction after almost 20 years of um, civil war, of tearing civil war. Um, so, the uh, um, at this point, um, Henry II was a Plantagenet that ruled from uh, 1154 to 1189, uh, as we've seen, son of, of Mathilda and Godfrey, um, managed to start a moment of, of stability uh, for, for the, the kingdom. And he governed, uh, as we've seen, as, uh, as an Anjou on both the um, chunks of the Norman uh, domination, so both the Kingdom of England and the Duchy of Normandy. Um, so in, in the French territory um, he um, managed to extend his, um, Henry managed to extend his power of, over the region of his own um, um, on on very uh, on very large lands, including uh, 
Anjou and Maine that uh, actually derived from his father's uh, uh, possessions. But famously, and this is uh, actually Henry II is one of the most important kings uh, definitely in English history, he married famously Eleanor of Aquitaine that had already been Queen of France as she was she had already been married to the French King Louis the Seventh, uh, from which she had divorced uh, at a point, and the uh, dowry that Eleanor brought to uh, Henry um, was enormous, and in this sense, it tied, f uh, you know, um, very it, it brought to enormous implications into here to European politics as um, into Henry's hands. Um, poured the, old, the regions of Poitou, Guyenne, and Gascogne. Mm -hmm. So, uh, actually, uh, yeah, this big chunk of southwestern France, of Aquitaine, mm -hmm. not really France proper, because France, technically speaking, was only the uh, northern France. These were, uh, uh, you know, southern lands that had also different mindset a different um, um, mentality and different language, different culture and so on. Um, there was also this contrast in fact initially between Louis the Seventh of uh, France and because he was an extremely stern person, um the French kings at this time were developing an extremely rigorous uh, intensely Catholic and morally um committed um lifestyle that uh, was assuming even certain sacral uh characters Eleanor of Aquitaine was an extremely lively uh, she was an extremely intelligent woman extremely capable she she was uh, one of the mm, most capable um queens of of the middle ages uh, she was also a very lively person she um, she was a bit of a very different, also very, uh, you know, passionate in minds. She's she very different from even the, the French models. So part of the reasons why and now they're complicated to, um, we don't have much time to, to, to discuss. is also this contrast that existed between the Northern French and the Aquitanians. And, and this, um, the, the marriage of Henry and uh, Eleanor was quite... Um, Eleanor, just to make you understand, for instance, when she went with his uh, husband in the Second Crusade, she rode on horseback like a knight. She was, you know, very, this kind of very sanguine and powerful character. And the the the, the marriage with with Henry II of of e England was um, extremely important because at this point, basically, the the Angevin dynasty, uh, as we've seen it now, the. Uh, we distinguish generally the Norman uh, dynasty from the Angevin one, but you can argue, you know, this was kind of this point that they were still French because also the Normans, as we've seen, were French. But at this point, if you look at map, famously the uh, the uh, say English domains, say better the Angevin domains, is that that was really the f the mindset existing at the point of feudal possession and of national character owned. More territory. Actually, I think at this point the majority of, of the French soil, mm -hmm. with the Aquitanian domains and the Duchy of Normandy. So it was an enormous power, way more powerful than the kingdom, uh, the the King of France himself. And this posed naturally great problems, and attrition between the two powers. So. As we were saying before, these was not were not really extremely compact domains. Naturally, uh, also in France, uh, the, the it's not that, that here the, the English ruled with iron fists. So that were local privileges, local traditions. So it, it, it was difficult even to control the, this big territory. So, yeah, very powerful, but also there were lots of problems connected with actually putting it, maintaining it together. In the first place, at the same time, however, the French king felt surrounded indeed. Um, 
so uh, among the other things um, in England, especially Henry, um, after Civil War, um, managed to recover all the public um, uh, properties that uh, had been uh, usurped during the uh, war between Matilda and Stephen. Um, so this equated basically to, to take them back from the control of the uh, barons and, and this entailed also the control of numerous castles. Uh, this is, I didn't stress this much but really you know there is a, a, a huge uh, chunk of um, the Normanistics that uh, looks at you know this uh, encastellation of England under Norman rule. This, as we've seen, was a very strategical um, enterprise. As you know, it was not just the spontaneous growth of castles here and there. It was actually a, a, an enormous um, work carried out by the Norman dynasty of control for in order to control all the various. Um, uh, English lands through these uh, castles was mostly actually Moth and Bailey at this point. Actually, the Normans began uh, at this time were very advanced also in, in military engineering. They, they were starting to build up also more solid uh, um, castles. As you can see, if you go in, in on vacations to Cannes, you can really look at these. Uh, massive fortifications that date back to the fact to the 12th century. Um, so these were uh, an extremely important mean of control of, of the various uh, of the kingdom. So the main problem here was to keep control of them. That's why the the civil war had been so disastrous because as long as everything f functions more or less well, in spite of this promise and the you know decentralization that always remain, etc. You, you can control the castles and enhance the territory, but when civil war breaks out and everybody starts doing what they want, essentially all these castles go lost and they're extremely difficult to recover because castles were at the time, given the military technology, couldn't be recovered like with a snap. Mm -hmm. So actually the easiest way, even before uh, getting involved into further warfare that also consumed resources and so on, it was kind of a political mediation, these castles were retaken in, in other ways. Some were lost, indeed. Uh, so not everything could be recovered, but under Henry II was this kind of re, uh, reconstruction, we can say, uh, even under this point of view, and uh, reason for which, um, in this time, the, the castles that were, were recovered were um, defended now with uh, royal uh, garrisons, uh, Henry also uh, committed himself in the consolidation of the administrative structure that had been created by his own predecessors, and he um, made um, rend he rendered stable the institution of the itinerant judges uh, that were in charge of the periodical inspection over the administration of the sheriffs. Um, another very important thing um, uh, he did was to re-establish the uh, the the feared. Uh, which um, had been uh, that th had been essentially the, the military uh, uh, this extremely important military apparatus that existed since uh, I don't know really when, but at least um, uh, it was rather uh, old. Uh, this was this militia essentially created by the local uh, rulers to made up of. Uh, of the local inhabitants, so this had made uh, together with the professional troops of the host girls and so on, the, the actually the numerical bulk of the it was a kind of a national army even at the time of um, he uh, it was created uh, telling the truth under Alfred uh, the Great. I I'm not sure whether um, it um, it existed in some f other form before, but say that the English monarchy had stressed this. Uh, had uh, um, strengthened the formal organization, especially to cope with the Viking invasions on the eastern coasts of, of Britain, in particular the, the Kingdom of Northumbria. Um, and this army was um, was actually called uh, called up once again, even after the Norman conquest, by William the Conqueror himself. Um, 
oh sorry um no I, I was just messing up i mean it was called naturally when uh, during the battle of hastings that that filled the the, uh, the feared and, and this had been obviously under norman times was um um uh, was kind of um declining given that naturally the normans didn't fancy very much having armed uh uh peasants but actually it is true the the normans also called up the feared uh to supplement the the norman levies it, it actually happened under henry the 1st uh, when he restored uh, he the uh, the loaves of Edward the Confessor, so uh, this happened. Uh, this had never died out really, because there are no things you can wipe out uh, as a form of military organization. The fear was con uh, initially conceived to um, to defend their shire. So theoretically, uh, this had always been a problem. Also, it's very interesting in English military history in the following centuries, always looking at you know the negotiation between the um the um the monarchy and the local communities to move these armies for for which time to which extent how far did this contingents go so this the fear had been born essentially as a for the defense of the shire so mostly defensive need then eventually these troops were called up also to perform other uh other duties think in fact about 1066 once the, you know Harold Godwinson brought the uh, the Anglo-Saxon army up to you know um, uh, to Stamford, then he he all he went all the way back to to Hastings. So actually, these were troops that were um, forced as as militia to participate to armies that were getting also more uh, more demanding, not just defending just local uh, community. Mm -hmm. And naturally, there were other professional troops as well, as we'll see. We, we will discuss about the feared more. Uh, more in detail in the in the future. So it's interesting that Henry II at this point um, uh, re uh, so in in the second half of the 12th century reinforced the feared, mm. uh, and so this um, mass conscription of Anglo-Saxon tradition. Um, Henry also widened uh, and extended the royal. Um, power in matters of justice and very important are uh, is the um assize of Clarendon that actually happened both in eleven six to four and into eleven sixty six. So uh also in here it's a bit complicated to go in detail but essentially these uh, assizes um attributed to the royal tribunals the competence over numerous um, chiefly criminal cases that um, had been previously judged only by feudal, uh, either lay or ecclesiastical feudal tribunals. Mm -hmm. So this equated to take away this um, the administration, uh, you know, the 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 judgment of these guys, uh, of these causes, sorry, and um, naturally, and this was the most important thing, um, seizing uh, the revenues of justice for the uh, for these cases that were also being associated to worse crimes were also the ones that uh, contemplated the higher fines. So the also more money considering that who administrated justice also received part of uh you know uh, of a percentage of the fine in order to carry out the the authority so th uh, the control over justice especially if you want to understand well the middle ages you have to uh, to to consider it always because uh, whoever controlled justice um could really do a freaking lot of things not just uh, obviously taking the revenues but also uh, uh controlling in fact at a, at a local level um the uh the social order so like in this case the, the uh, first of all it equated to uh, uh, reduce the um feudal prerogatives in taking this um this power back to the king in a more centralized fashion however the um the m measures of the uh, assizes uh, of uh, of Clarendon um 
in in fact exactly for 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 the very reason we we said now caused a very strong reaction especially from the side of the english clergy um the main reason was that essentially um the these assizes had put into discussion the uh, uh traditional immunity uh, jurisdictional immunity of the english church so to these assizes by the way the, uh, it was um uh established that the um the members of, of the clergy that had that were mm, you know uh responsible of guilty of of, of um of uh, theft and of um of other even worse uh uh, uh crimes like even homicides um after having gone through the ecclesiastical justice that always existed on their own had also to be um bro uh, to be judged by the royal tribunals it was very very important because the church usually enjoyed such immunities for which they basically could do whatever they wanted and um this was arguably happening everywhere but definitely the idea of calling for justice in such cases and and having an authority like the one of the king who said okay now we take care of this was something um it was a very strong political mm, action mm-hmm. and it uh, the church was extremely worried because at this point the the monarchy was regaining steam let's say and um expanding its power also into ecclesiastical matter um so the archbishop of canterbury thomas becket was um in this sense the the main representative of the opposition against uh the crown because of this and he was condemned as a traitor eventually uh, and had to flee to france but uh when he got back to england in 1170 he was um killed in uh Contem- canterbury's cathedral in uh, this is also a very famous episode and um actually the the circumstances into which he was killed are not very um very clear um so we will not now go into detail with this but uh, um naturally this is all the story eventually uh, the, the main problem is that the uh the 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 pope had uh, uh, at this time a lot to say into the matter um he um he was naturally worried that a uh, a sovereign could a lay sovereign could extend his power so consistently uh against the um i mean over the church in his own kingdom and this was also a matter of great um a great importance during the political balances of medieval kingdoms you know how much uh, the uh, the monarchs could really have a say to the local um church uh, uh affairs so the um the pope basically was uh, i mean the, the king was uh, henry the second was obliged to you know to repent to make this very um humiliating uh penitence and to in order to to tempt the uh the papal indignation and he also was forced in this sense to abolish all the um, let's say the the more unfavorable measures that had been taken uh over um you know against the church by his legislation um however in spite of this there was a extremely um say uh, a resounding event eventually thomas becket was 
uh, also mm, uh, you know conceived in this sense as a martyr there is all the idea that also many movies made about it actually I don't know it's stupid to say but uh, it's one of those iconic events. This is what I'm tr saying, trying to say that had a great um, um, impact on the uh, history of um, of um, uh, you know of not just the English history, but he, uh, for instance, Thomas Becket is venerated as a saint and a martyr hmm, by both by the Catholic Church and the Anglican Communion, but you know, if you really look at how these things, uh, you know, this thing took place, you might question actually the um, how this event really happened. It was a much, it was a much dirtier business than 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 we could think, and ultimately all because the church wanted to to do at this point what, what the hell uh, they wanted without uh, having uh, suffering the interference of, of the king into these matters of very serious crimes. So naturally also here the, the monarchy was not doing because they were so saint and pure and they, they all obviously had their dirty uh, interests. But naturally also given the history of England and its quite tormented relation um, between... Um, the you know let's say the monarchy and uh, I can say the people in a certain sense of all the what happened eventually with the Magna Carta and eventually with the Civil War um, it's something that um, really assumes a a greater meaning a greater a political meaning most of all that obviously um, has has to do with the uh, limitation of the monarchy. That is something the, uh, at least in, to the, the English political tradition is like a cornerstone of. Um, and so we will maybe get a bit more in detail uh, in, in on another occasion. Uh, just for saying that history, you know, we weren't there, so we we can't really say. But it, and, and from what we can see, actually things were a bit more complicated than obviously the the, the simple story of the poor archbishop massacred on the altar by the uh, evil um, royal knights that however produce so many also beautiful artist uh, beautifully artistical you know works and so on so we can't really complain about that at least um, but perhaps historical accuracy is a bit more important so um, however um, Henry the second really uh, was important for for many other reasons. For instance, he launched the uh, the invasion of, of of Ireland. I made a video some time ago that doesn't deal with that, but uh, takes into consideration the um, what's the title here? Medieval Irish warrior, twelfth, thirteenth century. So it could be interesting if you like the, the historical setting. Uh, and the, the the conquest of uh, Ireland occurred under this time. Um, the oh, relatively to the submission of the of Henry II to the Pope at this time, the Pope was Alexander III. Uh, he he was absolved eventually by the Pope for um, for Thomas Becket's uh, killing and. Um, at this time, you have to think that the church had uh, was reaching the moment of greatest the acme of power at this point. Into uh, historically speaking, like never like uh, un under Alexander the Third, the um, the Roman Church managed to influence so heavily the um, the secular affairs, and so it was also important to 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 be careful to deal with. The um, you know the uh, the papacy at this time everything was extremely complicated intertwined also with the politics the relations with France now we're skipping lots of things actually but just look at these things as mostly a political thing hmm. um, so at this time Henry the Second was 
governing a very solid uh, sovereign, the, uh, indeed the uh, Henry was arguably the, the most powerful monarch, monarch of all of Europe. He was indeed uh, king of England. He mastered two-thirds of France, extensionally speaking. Um, he um, managed to um, marry um, two of his daughters to respectively the uh, king of Sicily and the duke of, of Bavaria at this time. Uh, this was also very... Um, you know that England at this time was usually allied uh, in... Um, with with Saxony and Bavaria, so the the wealth um, powers, because at this point the the Swabians instead were allied with France, so this is all the game that happened. And by the way, England was um, as we've seen was expanding a lot uh, economically speaking, and especially London traded extensively uh, with the um, with Saxony, with the Rhine Valley, with Cologne, so the north of Germany was very important, strategically speaking, for the English to be allied with. Um, so this now I'm skipping <laughs> lots of things like you know towards the last years of the kingdom that Henry's sons actually took arms against him, um, actually. This was a, a like in any feudal kingdom at this point. The, the world story is extremely um, mm, dramatic, to to say uh, at least. Um, so I'm gonna skip this because the video is not about it. Um, but these are all things. Sooner or later, uh, I will go into the. You you realize that I'm making kind of manualistic. Uh, videos at this point, so we don't have the time to go in detail with every single uh, event that occurred into these uh, 150 years of English history, so it's mm, just to sum up, to be brutally concise and not much more, unfortunately. But the point I was making is, however, that the um, the the subtle machine that had been built by the Plantagenet allowed the English monarchy to maintain um, its strength, uh, its cohesion, even during the kingdom of Richard Lionheart, that ruled these ten years between 1189 to 1199. Um, and as we were saying before, uh, Richard Lionheart actually remained uh, only of these ten years, actually only two months into England. So he participated to the Third Crusade. He's one of the Heroes of the Crusades at that time, but the, the main, the big guys were definitely um, Richard Lionheart, um, Philip II of France, and Frederick uh, Barbarossa as you know the champions of Christianity. Also, as as nice actually, because uh, here we are at really at the peak of chivalric um, culture, and especially in in England and to France, now also in Germany, telling the truth, they, you know, these were the main countries for in terms of um, knighthood, you know, at least ideally speaking, because naturally knights existed everywhere if you took, you know, at this time, Spain, Italy, uh, even the Scandinavians at this point were expanding. I mean, feudalism was a bit uh, now all around. But um, these were the kingdoms that were definitely representing at best, the the feudal um, political institutions. So, it was really their societies that were oriented towards that direction. Um, think about, you know, William Marshall. Think about it, all these names that represented a bit the the epitome of of chivalry in in history. Um, at least for for those for those generations. Um, so. However, the the English history was to uh, you know to take a kind of a worse path. Eventually, especially the thirteenth, uh, especially for the fourteenth and fifteenth century, were moments of great uh, instability to England, and um, this um, had 
happened because of what was happening to these 12th, 13th centuries eventually. That we will see briefly now, because the tension between the crown and the great barons was definitely increasing. Mm. Um, even in here, the feudal prerogatives were kind of expanding in some way. Um, the English kings were uh, m making war continuously, really. Um, so this brought to an increase in taxation, and you realize that also the English society was transforming. Brutally, I made a video about the uh, the uh, recruitment of English armies at um, in in um, during the actually the thirteenth and the fourteenth century. Uh, this is the title: English armies recruitment in the thirteenth, fourteenth century. So that's pretty much it. Um, and this actually shows how true the... this was a moment of great increase of warfare throughout all of Europe and as we've seen English monarchs were a bit on the lead for what it concerned naturally uh, the British islands and, 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 and France as a military power as you know uh, as a military power so uh, this was a process also of strengthening of feudalism so English society was slowly transforming into something more like that. I mean with the the, the impoverishment of the um the uh say the freemen, as it always happened, the increasing power of the feudal uh aristocracy, uh, all these terrible wars, heavy taxation and so on would break essentially the middle classes and um, feudalism expanded, and in, in, in feudalism expanding, naturally also the the power of the um, the monarchy increased. Uh, excuse me, of the uh, f um, of the feudal um, nobility increased. Mm -hmm. So also the monarchy now was kind of struggling because one thing had been, as we've seen before, even with the um, you know the attempts of the Anglo Normans, uh, the Anglo Norman dynasty to even preserve the well-being of the boroughs, of these trade centers, commoners, etc. Um, it had been aimed at really balancing the power. Now the, the, the balance was kind of crumbling. Mm -hmm. and, and the feudal nobility was becoming increasingly more uh, aggressive towards the monarchy. And with John uh, the First also known as John Lackland, who ruled uh, between 1199 and 1216, who was uh, Richard's uh, brother, he succeeded him on the throne, um, and the the precision of the monarchy was definitely compromised. Now, John the First of England is usually um, shamefully represented uh, for what he really was. Actually, John Lackland was a great king. Uh, he managed to deal, um, to maintain things in, say, to save what it was possible to save uh, in this period. The fact that uh, England screw up because, uh, you know, that they lost the Battle of Bouvines and it was this massive loss of all the French territories. I mean, this is naturally important. You can't take it out of, of, of the account. But hey, it's a battle in battle, in war, things can go that way. If you look at what actually John achieved, he was extraordinary. He was clever enough to understand where, what, what he had to do. He was a much better king than Richard Leinart. Telling you the truth. Richard Leinart was an extremely good uh, knight, indeed. But, uh, his, uh, but John was a much better king. And also here there are many um, ideological reasons for which this king has to have been depicted negatively and all the problem of the Magna Carta so this uh, kind of sadistic uh, pleasure of saying ha ah, you see that's where we managed to impose the evil king and were prerogatives well no it, it really didn't happen in that way these were essentially a bunch of aristocrats who wanted to do what the hell they liked um, and English society was to become a mess uh, in the following centuries so it's not truly really a such a big thing. And actually, John Lackland was a very good king, in my opinion, at least. Um, the um, Because he maintained, he was able to maintain the order, eventually, of all the 
very heavy blows that he that the, the, the English kingdom suffered at that point. So at this point the um you know the English were constantly fighting with the French. <laughs> Whatever you know, it's a bit of a constant uh, uh, in history. Uh the um and actually the French king um Philip and the second Philip Augustus also known as such already before Bouvine actually had been able between 1233 uh, 1207 to um take away from uh from the English monarch all the major French uh, possessions Normandy that was indeed the kind of a uh, the the uh, the ideal you know original m land of the of the <laughs> norman monarchy uh, of england maine anjou so these were anjouins kings so you <laughs> take away the anjou it's not really very comforting the touraine uh, auvergne and bretagne bretagne was also um uh, really uh, was a bit more of a autonomous land that didn't have such a great um was never fully under control nor of the english nor of the uh, french uh, but nevertheless this was still a, an area that in that switched from you know the english influence to uh, french influence uh, once again so at this point actually were attempts even to invade england from france as the French king was now rocketing in power. In the meanwhile, uh, um, Philip II was extremely... He, he was one of my fairest, uh, favorite characters in medieval history, actually. Uh, he was um, arguably, after Louis XIV, the, the greatest French king, uh, debatably, actually. Um, and he... Um, uh, was essentially carrying out this reconquest of the northern French territories with his own um, personal retinues, most of which were also mercenaries at this point, uh, as mercenarism was really rising, and, and, and paradoxically mercenaries were much more f uh, faithful, actually, as long as there were money, at least to be paid with, um, than the feudal lords, and actually the, the the French king, as we've seen, also was pretty much troubled at this point because the the feudal lords were very difficult to curb into France. Um, and while he was campaigning against the English in the north, he had sent uh, basically uh, it kept busy in this sense the, the French uh, nobility by sending them into the crusade against the Albigensians in the south of France. So that was a a, a freaking uh, terrifying ground. So even the, the 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 French nobility got bogged down in there. You know that the Fran the Albigensian Crusade basically saw the the conquest under Simon de Montfort of almost all of southern France. And then eventually he died at the siege of Toulouse. That was the last Amapus, and basically the Crusaders lost once everything. Then eventually only for through marriage ties, this however now sensibly weakened. Um, Southern, uh, say these Occitan lands uh, were um, practically absorbed by the, the French uh, kingdom, which at that point, in the mid 13th century, reached its mm, it was the most powerful country in Europe. Um, and this had been done also, however, thanks to this very clever um, strategy of Philip's um, at this point. So actually, even before Bouvine, the English had lost all of the, uh, almost at least all of the uh, French territories, and were now being threatened in their own, uh, in in the same England by French invasion. That happened at some point; it was halted eventually. Um, and and at this time, John was extremely clever to basically seek the intervention of the papacy by declaring. Um, the King of England to be uh, the Pope's vassal. This was very brilliant to do because naturally it entailed um, a huge interest from the papacy that now was um, that at this point was allied 
with the with the French. Um, so obtaining the vassalage of a kingdom like England was a very big thing, and as we've seen, there had been all those struggles previously under uh, Henry the the Second, the problem of the you know the, the attempt of the English Church to extend its power over the the English. Um, of the English monarchy to extend its power on, over the English church. Um, therefore, now this equated to a lot of money flowing into the um, into the papal treasure, and at this point, this uh, basically the papacy allevi- uh, obliged the French to alleviate uh, in part the pressure on England. So that's a very brilliant move, and also reveals John's skill in many ways. Um however the um the following year in twelve fourteen, so this fatidic year, this was this coalition that was led by the same Pope, still Innocent the Third, um that um basically um was signing at this point against um the um Otto of Brunswick. I was reflecting now because um, there is a video I made that discusses European uh, international politics at that time. So, if you are, I think you're almost all very well acquainted with that period. But um, let's see where we can find this. Mm. I should find you the title. I think it's you uh, see so you can and it, that deals essentially with the um you know the blocks of power now that existed that were essentially the Welfen that were allied with the English and the uh Owenstauf and the, uh, the Ghibellines that were allied with the with the French Uh, so here it is, from Henry the Sixth to Bouvin, the struggle for the empire. So this focuses a little bit more on actually the Holy Roman Empire proper, because this was mostly a problem now with the papacy and the current um, king of the Romans, uh, Otto of Brunswick, that had basically usurped the, uh, you know, he had made a promise to the papacy not to reunite Germany and Sicily. Now was trying to do the same again. So the papacy backed now. Uh, the Hohenstaufen, Frederick II was still a minor at this point, uh, but the Hohenstaufen now were siding definitely against the Otto of Brunswick and his English allies, and uh, we will definitely talk about the campaign of Bouvin in that year, both about the campaign and the battle sooner or later, um, because it's an ex- uh, oh, remember that the battle of Bouvin is without any. Uh, mm, other, uh, it's the most important battle of the Middle Ages, mm-hmm. uh, and there is no other standard you can judge. Uh, Bouvin was the most important battle of the Middle Ages. Point. Don't come up with things like I don't know Poitiers or the, no. Bouvin is by far, compared to any other battle of the Middle Ages, the most important battle, historically speaking. Historically speaking, because it also was a a relatively contained military event. I mean, I'm not making that point. There were much larger battles and so on. But the consequences of Bouvin really changed history forever. For so many reasons. Because it allowed the uh, Frederick II to become Holy Roman Emperor, King of Sicily, and so on. It um, uh, made uh, also the, in this sense, the, the German directions going into very different ways. Uh, internally speaking, also for the future of the uh, German monarchy. It brought to the rise of France, to the uh, main power in Europe, and starting this um, uh, French papal angevin uh, block that eventually expanded even later. And it brought to the Magna Carta that could be considered also uh, maybe one of the other most important events in, into world history. Um, so definitely Bouvine wins as the most important battle of the Middle Ages. Um, so this was um, naturally, as you understand, a uh, Anglo-German defeat against the French, uh, and 
it, it brought basically to the final collapse of the English uh, rule in in France, at least up to the up to the 14th century. Uh, so for one for more than one century, this gave a terrible edge for the French to consolidate their power um, and. The um, because at this point uh, the uh, basically uh, the uh, the forces of, of John had reinvaded France, so they were now reuniting with the German their German allies, and um, trying to destroy essentially the, the French monarchy in into battle. And instead, Philip II managed to, to win in this incredible, uh, very with great both strategical and tactical skill against its enemies. So at this point, um, when John Lachlan came back to, I mean John the First, and say it better, came back to to England, he had to. Naturally, his power had radically shrunk, and so all the barons had rebelled. I mean, at least most of them, not just the barons, but actually also the clergy and the mercantile cities, um, who were, you know, you have to imagine. Bovin now as this collapse not just from a sheer military point of view but also from an economical one because now all the lands in France were lost so where to find the money uh, also these these military expenses been very high um, so it was a a, a disaster really a, a nightmare an apocalypse uh, and the um, this tells you also gives you a measure in terms of resources how a battle fought between some hundreds knights could really be so massively costly for those um, times uh, economical potential standards mm. so um, this changed history forever and as we know in June 1215 uh, John uh, was uh, say obliged by the events to sign a document the Magna Carta Libertatum so the uh, great charter of, of the uh, say liberties uh, into which were confirmed so it, it was nothing really new at this point it was just this endless f uh, uh, conflict going, uh, ongoing conflict between the centralizing attempts of the monarchy and the other um, bodies, how is wanna, we want to call, call them. So this uh, charter confirmed the freedoms of the, of, the, um, of the church, of the aristocracies and of the communes. So they basically were putting a limit to royal authority to make the, the, the long story short because the Magna Carta, by the way, it's not. Um, uh, there are other even arguably more important documents like the constitutions. Uh, I don't remember of, of, of Winchester. I, I don't remember the importance of the Magna Carta. Also, here has been a bit. Mm, um, I'm not saying it's not important, but there were other documents eventually during the 13th century that also strengthened that direction and were arguably also more important as single documents than the Magna Carta. But the Magna Carta began this trend for which now the, the English monarchy was much less powerful and much more limited and conditioned by the um, the, uh, the rest of, you know, the, the, the kingdom's um, uh, assemblies, representatives. <laughs> um, so the idea that the parliament as such was born, I mean in the, the concept that, that there was always this kind of um, coming together in the decision. Naturally this was much less, it, it sounded much less um, edifying, even though I realized the, the real the importance of this meaning of this, the idea of the compromise. This is something that lays within the, really a lot under the idea of common law, of the, the, the idea that of there has to be a common consensus for something to happen. You can't have a power that basically just imposes itself on the community. And this this is definitely a great step in the path of civilization. Um, but at the same time, it has naturally to be framed into historical context and not thinking it was just an ideal thing that happened for the good of the freedom 
what do you think that an English baron in the 13th century cared about the freedoms of the people? Not really much, right? most of it of his own. Yet, this is what conferred to England partly those mm, genetic characters uh, in, in political theory and practice that are at the base also of, e uh, of the success of England as a nation, eventually also in, in later history, especially after the uh, the English uh, Revolution. S um, um, so, and uh, after which basically Britain began to rocket to the stars and eventually was just uh, during the Seven uh, Years War that, that they made really made uh, England becoming the the really most powerful empire but um, or at least putting premises from that uh, but it's it's really something that that marked the history of England towards a direction that um, could have really gone otherwise I mean just think about in fact if talking about the importance of the Battle of Bovin if the Anglo of, um, Germans had won to that battle, and, and the English monarchy perhaps would have not uh, been so. Maybe the the power of the English monarchies would have strengthened way more. Maybe England would have become, in this sense, a, a much larger power in late medieval times, where instead it basically declined because it wasn't much of a great power anymore, especially after the the the, um, the end of the Hundred Years' War. Um, so. We don't know whether history would have been better or worse. As we can't just speculate. It's actually impossible to tell. But um, it stays, uh, still, if you really want to find one of those world-changing events, really look at the Battle of Bovin and of the Magna Carta as a consequence of that, because of the uh, from the English perspective. Um, and so, this is the main point. It it, it was the birth. Of the idea of a represent um, of a representation of the social bodies that was called essentially to comfort the sovereign uh, in order to offer counsel and collaboration and de facto limiting his own power. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. It's still very fascinating because in spite of this, the English monarchy was still capable of build of structuring in itself over time. Uh, indeed, you can argue that up to the uh, English, uh, uh, the English, uh, the English Civil War, um, it was possible, perhaps, for the English monarchy to once again impose its kind of absolutistic prerogatives that were being stressed, especially at that time. Uh, I'm personally a great a fan of the of the Stuarts um, uh, and the. Um, which also in here for ideological reasons have been kind of condemned and actually Stuart kings were pretty good kings and were trying finally and you know the reason of why the civil war eventually uh, broke out was always about this problem of taxes because that's the that's the point let's be honest that's the main problem of all times that's how even how the, the american revolution began it's it, it's all about taxes and in that context, actually, what the monarchy was trying to do was to create a state. I mean, to create a system that didn't function just by s robbing, I don't know, the monasteries or, uh, or making this weird balance in the, like the Tudor had basically done. It was really the problem of the modern state to build to to shape itself in a more permanent form, so that it could also ensure, sir, uh, simply the the. Um, the commoners at the point said nuts. We don't we don't want to pay your taxes. Point. And they started a war that eventually they they won. Um and to fully uh, you know get rid of the um direct uh 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 say let's say of the strong uh, monarchic influence but only with uh, with the glorious revolution of the end of the seventeenth century. Um but um, what is fascinating, especially d in particular during the Middle Ages, um, and if you read uh, Kantorovic's uh, The King's Two Bodies, you can really um, appreciate this uh, particularly, is showing even how in this context, actually, the, the English monarchy managed, managed to shape even a, a mystics of 
the monarchy. Um, then in this sense, um, probably was more even even more developed in England than in France. I mean, in France it was greater in a probably in other. I mean, it were simply different. They are difficult to compare, but there were certain. Um, mystical aspects of the monarchy was actually they were actually imported in France by from England, especially during the the moments when the English had captured almost all of France um, and and uh, the court of Paris and Tunis, the, the first half of the fifteenth century. Um, but it, the the history of England is extremely fascinating because differently from other kingdoms in the Middle Ages was a much more unitary domain, in spite even of this, in spite even of the... Um, and the Magna Carta is important in this sense because it shows you how these political bodies didn't really act as a destructive force of the system as such. They didn't create anarchy or chaos. They were actually cooperating with the, with the monarchy but keeping it in, in check in many ways. Um, and therefore um, at an aristocratic level that is also an anti-egalitarian one, we were actually s structuring paradoxically something more unitary because th they were all aware of the benefits that could derive even from having this well-organized kingdom that existed since the, you know, in fact, the Anglo-Saxon and Norman times and it would have been a pity to, to waste because through the limitation of the king, of the monarchy, this um, the, the the barons, the clergy, the, the main, uh, the wealthier uh, classes could really um, control this system as well. So even if you take, I, I'm really passionate, especially about medieval history and the development of uh, of uh, European armies during the uh the essentially the first half of the fourteenth century, what you see that is that England also in there makes a kind of unicum. And it was the only country that managed to because of its political institutional and uh, premises, political and social premises too, um to actually lead a transformation of the army from the top with uh, Edward the Third's reforms chiefly. Uh, that's something that basically never happened in the rest of Europe at the time that was instead experiencing that from the bottom of society. So in a way that eventually never got fully organized, whereas the, the Kingdom of England maintained its own um, very efficient degree of administration, and you see this also in the military administration, when I made a video about... I um, can't find it now, but... Uh, yeah, this is one, Breaching Enemy Walls, Considerations of Medieval Siege Warfare from 885 to 1332. Well, in there I was analyzing, among the other things, how were, uh, in, in this siege warfare, how the English uh, armies at this time were, were so well organized compared to others that had many, much less, because England, in this sense, was a country of old organization, of old national cohesion. Hmm? It always remained so. That's how they won the Battle of England during World War II. And it was this idea that everybody actually knew what to do, how the, how to act, wh what its place in society was. And this is important in English history, in my opinion. It's what re I really admire the most about um, about uh, the English and eventually all those who were integrated also more or less forcefully in their uh, domains. Um, because it's really um, an ordered view, mm. uh, a direct view. In, in a few countries, actually, arguably no other country has such uh, unity of intent sometimes. Now, naturally, well, this opens to <laughs> many, um, many different, many other different ideas but um, uh, and debates. But uh, actually, yeah, I think this is what I wanted to say today. And sorry, I skipped. You know, I treated the Magna Carta like in 15 minutes, so <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. But uh, we will naturally have to. Um, we will surely come back on the Magna Carta, so don't worry. This was this video was not intended to 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 stop particularly on that. It was just the last step of the video. Uh, what I wanted to give you today and leave you with was 
indeed the, the the picture of the wall because this is why I make this kind of sort of manualistic level videos because uh, I will I want to talk about many things on Schwerpunkt and I need to get the essentials done first then we can go deeper you know Schwerpunkt is still a baby now it, it's it's just uh, more than one year old so you have to give him time to, to grow huh? and when he will be old enough he will be able to produce more and better <laughs> hopefully also thanks to your support that I see it, it's very much increasing uh, recently I can't wait to actually arrive to my number 300 videos so when I will you know that every 300 videos I talk about um, how the channel is faring and so on um, so I have many interesting things to tell you, but however, I want to thank you because I reached now the number of videos, um, I mean the number of uh, subscribers is about to surpass the one of videos, hopefully. <laughs> uh, it's, I know it doesn't sound like a huge achievement because indeed um, I have now how many? 256 followers, sub uh, subscribers, so th th that's really great to me. and. As always, uh, I, I don't really care much about the quantity, but rather the quality. And I'm very thankful for anyone who is supporting me, who is listening to me, who is uh, going over the fact that my English sucks, that my videos are pretty monotone, graphically speaking, that um, you know I could do things better. And I can tell you, it's um, sometimes it's it's difficult to make these videos because it it takes me now quite of a quite of a long time and I have also many other things to do but I'm I'm so passionate about this now and um, I really want to talk about history here uh, and with you not uh, as a form of you know cathedratic uh, attitude for which you know that I don't feel myself to be a, a teacher now I'm just discussing history with you and I really appreciate you following me because it means that in spite of all my uh, expectations that some of you appreciate my contents which is um, <laughs> it's not about me I, I don't care personally you don't have to appreciate me nor what I do personally it's really about the fact that there are so many people who are interested about history and they want they're willing to listen such contents because probably it's something they're interested in for real and I, uh, I get we're still a few doing this together, but uh, you know, good, but few. Let's say it uh, in this way, and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's how I I see it. Um, so this was all for now, and I just hope to to have given you this broad, you know, picture between. Uh, of English politics and administration between 1066 and 1215 and we'll surely come back on this and go also naturally on other parts of English and, and also British history naturally um, as a whole and um, okay for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye